All right, that is so good. Okay, welcome to Radicalized. I'm Heidi Kuda. We are here with Jim Stewartson, High Yo. Fidelity, and Sean Connor. These are my favorite disinformation sleuths bringing us the news from the gutters of depravity and sedition. Uh, we want to thank everybody for your wonderful support of our debut episode last week. And gentlemen, we may as well get right into it. We had a pretty fucked up Friday. Uh, Jim, do you want to start uh, how, you know, discussing what you thought about the Rittenhouse acquittal? Um, <clears throat> it was not unexpected. Uh, the judge, I called him Grand Wizard Palpatine because he looks like the emperor and he's obviously a KKK member. Like the guy is as like biased as I've ever seen any judge ever. I mean, he had a like a MAGA song on his phone for God's sake. Um, and so it's not surprising that the little Nazi got off um, what, you know, is I guess also unsurprising, but I mean, even for Flynn, uh, it looks like Flynn and Rittenhouse are, are in the same city today, Edgewood, uh, 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 Florida. So, you know, that little fucker is going to be a, a hero. And, uh, you know, I can't well, wait. Well, later in the show, we're going to talk about how uh, these guys are engineered for a certain outcome. Um, High Fidelity and I were on Ruth Benjiot's a uh, weekly conversation about authoritarianism when the news came down. And even though it was not unexpected, I still cried my eyes out uh, because it's wrong. And uh, I think we all know it's wrong. And I was not surprised at all when Madison Cawthorn was talking about him being his intern, because that's exactly what this is. They're going to use him as a prop. Uh, Sean, what were your thoughts? Well, from my perspective, <clears throat> it was very odd to see this trial go on as long as it did. I think it should have been mistrialed earlier on. I thought the prosecutor, the state prosecutor did a horrific job presenting Horrendous. his- Horrendous. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, and this guy has a good track record. It was very strange. Like, you know, he's not an unknown commodity. He's done good, good uh, uh, law in the past. So it was, a, the one thing I think that everyone knows the judiciary is, is not um, <clears throat> always fair. And so I think in this trial we saw the whole nation saw how much a judge can influence a case you know that's i mean when you go into court you have the rules of evidence and procedure but you have a judge that will decide you know when your motion's in limine what's going to come in and what's going to not come in and that basically sets the the ground level for the entire case now this judge seemed to, to decide and change things and and apply law here and lay there but that's just what you deal with in any courtroom this one was just on a national scale it was broadcast to the whole country so they could see that. Now, I'm just shocked it didn't get mistrialed earlier, which, I mean, I cannot believe it didn't get mistrialed because of the number of opportunities that there were to throw this case out. It's going to get appealed. Who knows? I mean, the, the appeal, the appellate court's going to have, oh, it's going to be a nightmare um, because there's so many things that are wrong with this case, just technically, just from the procedure standpoint, without getting into any of the uh, sort of overlay of, of the, the, the politics and the and the race issues, but just procedurally, it was a nightmare. I am looking forward to more information coming out on Judge Bruce Schroeder and his uh, sentencing records. I look forward to the like coming this. investigations. And High Fidelity, what do you say? All right, so to, to, to be honest, um, I don't think anybody's surprised the kid got off at least the first go round, uh, you know, the, the state has the ability to bring charges. Uh, there are federal charges that could be brought. Um, this isn't over for Rittenhouse in any way, shape or form. I don't want people to be depressed, angry, upset, uh, because that's what they want. They want you to be in despair that our systems are broken and there's nothing we can do to fix them. And that's just the way it is now. It's obvious in the way they utilize. I mean, Matt got, before Madison Cawthorn, Matt Geitz said, "Oh, hey, I want to make him my intern." You know, to which my first thought is, "Does Rittenhouse even have a Venmo?" I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, uh, that whole lead up was just for that joke, wasn't it? Man? It was. Well, it done. totally was. I'll admit it. I, I had that joke. I had to roll with it. Testing um, the material. We forgive you. All right. All right. But uh. 
No, it's, it's it, Kyle Rittenhouse is a pawn. He is yeah. he is a nobody and is a nothing, and all he is is a messaging tool. And he's going to find that out real fast when push comes to shove. Yeah, right? he's he's going to get mind fucked in every possible way. I mean, he already has. He had Ricky Schroeder in there teaching him how to act in court for a year. Well, yeah, Ricky <laughs> Schroeder. Uh, oh, and he still did a terrible job, which says something about Ricky Schroeder why he's not working now. But anyway. Um, also, guys, what uh, is interesting, Joseph J. Flynn actually posted on Twitter about, hey, I brought Ricky Schroeder and Ellen Wood together and I hooked up that whole thing. So it's interesting that Joseph J. Flynn, Mike Flynn's brother, is bragging about bringing this whole nonsense together. And then, the, you know, a couple of days after the kid gets off, he's hanging out with Mike Flynn. Um, yeah. Which actually, don't get me started on Joe. He's an errand boy and in his own brother's cult, which is really weird. I um, think it's very interesting that he's taking such a keen interest in you guys. Well, so clear, clearly, 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 you guys are reaching. He's him. afraid of me. Are you kidding me? He's a punk. Whatever. Hey, before guys, um, before we go on, I wanted to make that disclaimer to our audience that I'm sneaking Wi-Fi off of a third floor uh, corporate. Uh, <laughs> ballroom here in dallas uh, i'm on the road so if i sort of start getting sketchy it's because somebody's going to go in this health spa next to me and uh, i'm trying to keep the low profile while the dallas cowboys are outside there playing on that gives huge, me, huge screen that gives me a great opportunity to thank everybody for their wonderful comments uh last week yes we are aware that we have uh somewhat queasy audio and video at times uh, but we've got great information so bear with us uh particularly with our main engineer and art director being on the road, stealing Wi-Fi from a random a rando hotel. You see what we go through for you? <laughs> you see our audience? You see how much we love you? Hey, hey, there might there might be a little bit of noise, but the signal comes through. That's the important. Uh, well, let's yeah. hope. Uh, so, Hi-Fi, you also um, offered some brilliant words, which I wish you could repeat on Ruth's show, because while I was crying like a baby, you actually sort of calmed us by reminding us what was actually really happening. What What's really happening is we're in an influence war. Um, that's it, It's there's the global rise of fascism. We are in an influence war where our enemy is intentionally and continuously inflicting uh, mental trauma upon us as a society. I mean, think how much of a sense of relief people got when Trump got kicked off of Twitter and he was no longer like in the news every day for running his mouth and saying awful things, right? And and that would, we have to be cool. We have to maintain our cool. What they want is they want us full of despair. They want us to feel like we're broken. They want us to feel like there's nothing we can do. That is what they want. We cannot give that to them. Nope. We have to remain cool. We got to remain cold anger. We need cold, cold anger. Yeah. Because if you get hot <laughs> anger. And and listen, guys, I, for, coming from this guy, that's saying something. <laughs> I, I, I've got a lot of hot <laughs> anger, trust me. I, I, so, I love what you said about cold anger, smart mind, uh, and, you know, smart action. You know, I think that's really where we're at. Um, you for, also for talked me, a little bit. It's not about despair. It's not about any of that. It's about people understanding. I don't want you to be, you know, de in despair. I want you to be pissed off, maybe a little scared because shit's coming, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But fuck no, nobody should be in despair. <sighs> We've been through shit before. But this is a big one. And so I think for, for me, it's just about, it's about taking that despair, letting it flow through you, as it were, and coming out the other side with a little bit of uh, grit in your teeth and, and, you know, a little uh, straightening in your back and let's go. Let's, let's, yeah, let's, we, we uh, need iron in our spines. Thing. And, and, you know, it's mostly just about getting other people to understand it because they see the symptoms of it they feel it it's it's everywhere around them they get that things are are wrong but it's very hard to understand why and so you know what i hope for this what i've been trying to do is just sort of break it down a little bit and and make it clear 
you know you're not crazy <laughs> well <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd like to help this out really with is people. going on yeah this is yeah. this is absolutely going on and yeah. and actually you know given what Rittenhouse is and how he's being used and the messaging that Mike Flynn is putting out there um, that kind of brings us to well it's a little learning segment that I like to call word of the day and well here's your word of the Word of the day, word of the week, let's say. It's the word of the week. Talk to your friends about this word. Sean, did you have an intro for that or no? I don't. Uh, I could try it, but uh, we'll see if it works. Let me see. Hold on. Uh, I like how his word of the day is actually two words, so it's technically a phrase yeah, of the day phrase. or phrase of the week. But I know, Phrase man, of the week. You, you, you bring this, this whole segment in, and then you okay. screw it up the first time. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Well, it's the first time. Of course, I'm gonna screw it up. Yeah, man. so I was gonna, I was gonna green screen this, but I didn't have time, so we'll just watch it in overlay. All right. There you go. All right. The phrase of the week here: stochastic terrorism. All right. I'm gonna give you a quick textbook definition of what st stochastic terrorism is. Mm -hmm. Stochastic terrorism is when an individual with a large public platform a celebrity, a politician, some sort of leader, right? That leader then demonizes in public an individual or a group, right? And the reason they demonize that individual or group is to bring about, to incite an act of violence against that individual or group, right? Like if you look how, uh, What's his face? Portnoy from Barstool Sports talked evil things about the woman who, who wrote an article about him. And right. suddenly all of his trolls just ganged in on her and made the poor woman miserable and like scared her, traumatized yeah. her. Right. 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 What he did there was stochastic terrorism. And the reason you do that is because what it does is it increases the chances of an attack that is statistically probable, meaning it's going to happen, we just don't know when, right? So it increases the chances of that attack, but you can't define the specifics of that attack. It's lone wolf radicalization, basically, is what they're doing. You'll see something, yeah, the, you'll, you'll see something similar to this in the, uh, in the Elon Musk, the, the, the you know, the Tesla Q area where you have the uh, the short sellers and you have these groups and you have Elon Musk mobilizing his troops sort of against anyone who has a negative comment about Tesla. I mean, it, and you'll see this in similar uh, groups across the internet. It's 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 a huge huge problem. There's current litigation that's trying to address it, but the judges back again. The judges have no clue. They don't understand it. They barely even know what a, a retweet is or a subtweet is. And so you have to educate them on the, on these topics because it just goes over their head. Right. Motions, so, motions, motions have been turned away time and again because it's too confusing. One thing I want to say before uh, Jim's uh, Jim brings up his point of view on this is that the the article that you were talking about is in Business Insider. It's by a writer named Julia Black. She has been absolutely uh, beat up as we have all you know experienced before. Um, online in this very uh, coordinated effort. And she is actually hoping to the reporters who watch us, she is hoping that somebody picks up the story of uh, this Barstool Portnoy guy and takes it further. And that really is how we can do this by building the tribe and building our army uh, so people aren't isolated when these attacks happen. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I mean, Stochastic terrorism is usually thought of as, as kinetic terrorism, right? So if you think of uh, the mass shooters, um, white supremacist mass shooters, the plague of them that we had in 2019, that's stochastic terrorism. That is uh, ginning up a whole bunch of Islamophobia, for example. Right. Um, getting a whole bunch of Nazis trained up in you know new zealand and wherever you know all over the place and hoping one of them pops out and does it and you know in 2019 several of them did all in a row 
Yeah. And it kind of pointed a, a whole bunch of things out, I think, in society that, that you know, people had been burying for a while. Um, so that's sort of on the extreme of it, right? But you're right. You can apply that same principle to uh, to internet trolling. It's, you, you know, it's, it's the old, um, uh, uh, can you, I wish someone would get rid of that meddlesome priest or whatever that uh, um, quote Will is. Will no one rid me of this Thank meddlesome you. priest? Yeah, Beckett. Yeah. Uh, and yes, what and was you're, that? Not, you're not actually asking for it, right? You're not telling anyone to do it. Right. You're just asking the question. And, you know, it's the same, it's the same thing that led to one six, right? Trump was up there and he never actually said, you know, go break into the Capitol. But all the stuff he said, everything leading up to it all around it led to, you know, that result. And that he, was really he, he did say, Russia, if you're out there, I'd love to see those emails. <laughs> Russia, if you're listening, that's the yeah. last one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a whole so, bunch of people went after it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's so important. And I'm so excited about Jim's upcoming news block because uh, he's going to be looking at some relatively recent history. And when we mine our history from 2016, even there's lots of important things that can be put together. So before we get to why it matters, um, hi-fi, I just wanted to let our viewers know that um, two of our first critical reviews came through and the very first one, uh, is this is the vapingest podcast ever. <laughs> that was the first <laughs> critical review from one of our viewers. We've had almost a thousand yes. views, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, the response has been tremendous. Thank you. Guys. I, I thought that that was just a hell of an observation. And then uh, my favorite punk metal band from SoCal strung out their bass player wrote, you guys are all fucking smart people. Damn. And I- um, Bass players rule. <laughs> I know. I, you know, bass players are always my best friends. When I met bass Jim player. and found out he played bass, I was like, you know, that's all I needed to know. The rest is, uh, you know, I, I, I actually, I, I thought it was funny. I figured it'd be an opportunity for you guys to act like idiots when you're told that you're smart, but everybody kind of held it down. <laughs> that's because we're vaping. <laughs> that's right. It was, from okay. a, it, was from a bass, it was from a bass player in a punk band. Perfect. Oh, hey now. Actually, hey. actually, I'm just, we'll, we'll, I'm just gonna let out a couple secrets about high fidelity. Classically trained cellists can sing opera like a motherfucker, so that'll be for a, a holiday episode. Um, so let's get oh, to why. It's a holiday, isn't it? <laughs> well, we're getting there. No, no. <laughs> Come on, man. Not oh, right now, Sunday. bro. Oh man, he can sing. Uh, so let's get to why it matters. And do we have our intro, Sean? Or All right. So what was the big news this week that I think people need to pay attention to? Why it matters. So first story is uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle and the money. I never know if I say her last name right. Guilfoyle, is it? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so Kimberly Guilfoyle and the money. Uh, ProPublica released an article that shows that Kimberly Guilfoyle uh, was in the text messages of a bunch of uh, January 6th organizers and claimed that she was the primary fundraiser, raised big money. She said, hey, Millions. yeah, one of my donors alone gave $3 million, which that kind of sounds like the woman from Florida, the Publix woman. I don't remember her name, but uh, yeah, heiress of the Publix fortune. And, uh, and then and th this is the best part, right? So not only is she in there talking about, yeah, I helped raise money for the insurrection. She's in there talking about, because I raised so money, you need to let me put speakers on the speaking list and you need to let me get up on stage. Like, such a publicity hound. Did, yeah. did, did she or did she not used to do strip dances for donations? You guys remember that story? 
I mean, I can't. I, I, would do, I would do strip donation. I'd, I would. I'd, I would do I'd, stripping for donation. I mean, let's be careful. I'd rather her do that. Yeah. Uh, all Look. I can say is she's come a long way since she was Mrs. Look, Gavin Newsom. Kim, Kimberly Jetboil like got seriously netted and mind fucked. Yeah. But she used to be married to Gavin Newsom. Yeah, yeah. right. Yes. Or, or uh, were they married, or were they? Or yeah. Were they just, yeah. 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 And and now know, this, she wasn't a complete you know, raving lunatic before. She was, you know, whatever, a little sketchy maybe, but um, <laughs> what happens when you get into these situations is you get brainwashed, basically, right? Um, you, they they trauma bond you with like a bunch of crisis and shit. And, you know, everybody's all in it together. Yeah. And pretty soon, you're in a cult. And all I know is... in the Trump cult. I have like, been trauma bond to you, you guys. Know, yeah. Nuts. Yeah, I have been trauma bond to you guys, so I can totally relate. But what's really great is I don't have to sleep with Don Jr. That's the yes. best. That's the best. Ew. Yes. I would, no. Oh, I would stop. talk about, I don't even Poor want to think about that on the podcast. I'm, stop I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to offer a little sympathy. Um, okay, well, right, that's, yeah. uh, that's really horrible. And obviously it's not, I mean, it's funny, but it's not funny because we're talking about an insurrection. We're talking about people who died. We're talking about the ugliest day in our country's history in, you know, hundreds. Since the hundreds. Civil War. Precisely. Yep. So uh, so thank you for pointing that out because these are the headlines that get buried under the flood of shit. So what else do you have? You've got some neo-Nazis. Uh, uh, this is good so, news, right? Yeah, this is good news. So, you know, everybody's bummed out about Rittenhouse. Everybody's like, how the hell could the kid get off? You know, something that was buried in the news that people need to hear is that in Rome, Georgia, two neo-Nazi members of an organization called The Base uh, were sentenced to prison. And the reason they were sentenced to prison was for their part in a murder plot to kill a couple that they thought were Antifa. Antifa. Yeah. Um, so one of them was sentenced to six years in prison. One of them was sentenced to 13 years in prison. That's good. That shows the system can work, right? We yes. Could use some could tweaks. More. It can work. Yeah. It is yeah. a new Neon system. The reason why we're fighting is because it is, it, there, is, there, is, there is something good about it. We can feel that. But in my opinion, the justice system is, needs to be completely overhauled. We have, it cannot take three years to investigate people. The, yep. the entire court system and, right. and the delays and procedures, it's nuts. It, yeah. It, you, the, the, in, it, the, the court system and the, the actual way the world works work mm -hmm. on completely different time scales. Very true. It didn't used to be that way, right? It used to be that these time scales were the time scales of normal everyday life. It's not like that anymore, and we have got to update our justice system and the laws um, to, to take that into account. And guys, one thing it's important to remember is that there are solutions that have that are already been written out and offered up to, for Absolutely. these changes. Um, it's not like we're going to start from zero. Okay, yeah. It's just a matter of who has the power and control and who's lobbying, who's being more effective. You've got the Chamber of Commerce who constantly lobbies for tons and tons of money for uh you know mass tort reform uh and the, and the, 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 the game is getting rigged you know more by the day but there are people out there fighting for change and there are solutions that have already been written up fantastic solutions about sentencing about how to bring a case about how to file cases that are ready to go it's just a matter of pushing them getting them in front of the right people i love yeah. how we have a, a quasi lawyer on the team just for those who don't know sean runs a litigation support um a business so he's always in the weeds of the law so we really right. appreciate that um what i want is what what jim had mentioned before which is executive orders i want to declare that we're in an influence war i want the gop to be brought up on technical treason for being complicit in their role in this influence war and i want to see some bold action i feel like i'm just you know uh you know just uh talking into the wind but I have a dream and my dream yeah. is that we declare what we're really in and we start seeing executive orders to combat it. 
That's yeah. the thing we need the most is for someone to to say it out loud to the country. You're not crazy. This yeah. is happening. Yeah. This is this is well. This is Sheldon Whitehouse said it. Sheldon right. Whitehouse said, "There's a war, and it, you know billionaires are waging war upon this country." Yeah, Sheldon. He says, said it. He knows. Sheldon says lots of stuff. That's awesome. It's not the president. It's not you know a lot of other. Yeah, people. Joe needs to get on board. Yeah, Joe, if you're listening, handle this shit, man. Come on, don't make me do it. I don't want to. Frozen. <laughs> repeat, repeat, repeat what you just said, Jim, because we froze up a little bit. Uh, I have no idea. Oh, okay, good. All right. Well, moving no, right along, I, we're going to do something about Project Veritas <laughs> playing pretend. Little, yeah. We're gonna, we're all gonna, right. So we're, let's let's, let's uh, breeze through this so we can get right to Jim's hellscape. All right. Third story. Third story of the week is uh, Project Veritas plays pretend. And why is this important? Project Veritas pretends to be a journalistic endeavor. However, there were some documents leaked to the New York Times that said. Uh, they were basically conversations with their attorney, like, how far can we bend the law before we actually break it? Cambridge Analytica how, did the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. This is, they're hacking the system. They're trying to find any vulnerability they can exploit to break things, right? And so the New York Times got a hold of these, these memos, these emails and everything, and uh, they started releasing them. And this judge in the case uh, you know, he called a prior restraint case, which if you know anything about Watergate, you'll understand the rulings about prior restraint. Um, and New York Times is just like, what? No. Also, the thing I need to point out is, you know, the FBI just raided Project Veritas and James O'Keefe, right? And the reason they raided him is because of suspicion of being involved in the breaking and entering of Joe Biden's daughter's house to steal her diary, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and here's one more fact I got to add. Project Veritas, uh, funded by Donors Trust, which is Robert Mercer and the Coke, Net Coke Network, mm -hmm. trained by Eric Prince, mm -hmm. who is, uh, well, the guy's a warlord. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all that Eric Prince may have had something to do with Project Veritas breaking into, I don't know, but they're all connected. I'll tell you that much. Come on, man. Of course. Look. <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't have anything solid. I'm okay. not a fed. I can't break into their systems and no, look at all their no, stuff. Yeah, I'm not, you don't need to break into their system to know that. I mean, it was uh, in the hard New York times that these people get trained on Eric Prince's ranch in Wyoming yeah. by a British spy yeah. um, who used to be an MI6. Like, this isn't. Okay, that is a hard is, fact. That is yeah, a very hard so fact. is yeah. Seychelles so, and the pedo guy. <laughs> Yeah, Nader, you know? mm. yeah, he he went to the Seychelles to try to uh, to try to set up a action. back channel. Yeah, yeah we'll, little, we'll, little we'll back channel gonna, action for this Eric is a Prince. Good transition, right? maybe. Uh, oh I yeah, I want to say, I wanna say one more too. thing because I'm one, one of the three percent that that read every footnote in the Mueller report, every word, and all the texting and communication between Prince and Bannon during that Seychelles period was wiped. Wiped out completely. Oh, deleted. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, How that happened? I don't know. I don't know. But if you that, have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide. Hold on a second. But her emails. <laughs> All right, Jim. There's our segue. Uh, can we, uh, as if if Josh is still there hiding out in the hotel room, do we are we able to get Jim's hellscape going? Uh, Sean, you there? Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. Oh, fuck. <sighs> oh, love it. I've seen that so many times and it's still It's the best. It's the best. It's funny every time. I don't know why. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, awesome. it's, it's the oh fuck at the end. It's that the really voice. It's that the, the, the movie it's, voice. Yeah. It's the palate mm. cleanser before we get really freaking serious because Jim has some really serious shit to drop on us this week. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hide off screen, guys. It's getting a little wonky on my Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when 
when somebody walks by on their way to the spa in a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, Lo-Fi Productions right here. Uh, All right. So, so seriously, Jim, you read you you posted a, a thread that made your skin crawl based on I think maybe an uh, Oberman story or something that had. Yeah. Well, we uh, we were talking about Eric Prince, and um, so I've been looking you know very hard into Eric Prince. He's one of the um, puppet masters of this whole thing, um, and Eric Prince. Uh, met Flynn in Afghanistan and together they agreed that um, Islam is a crusade that they need to go on uh, to eliminate it from the earth. Um, Eric Prince is in a, is in a group called uh, the Knights of Malta, which is an arm of the Catholic Church um, that still believes it's fighting the crusades. Um, there's, I know this sounds like some kind of crazy Dan Brown novel, but it's real. There's 13,500 of them. There are princes one. I've been trolled by several. Uh, it's, it's, it's real and they're, they're extremely dangerous. At any rate, uh, is, is Islam is their, their main foe in their, in their minds. And Keith Olbermann did a, a piece on Blackwater. Everyone knows how evil Blackwater was. Yeah. Um, but it this clip really did make my blood run cold because it, it showed me precisely who Eric Prince is. Did you guys want to run the audio on this or did Jim do you want to talk over it or no, just run it. Okay. Let's see. This is the which one? The Oberman piece? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And if it if it boots us out, then we'll just cut it and we'll just well, fix it in post. <laughs> executive for Z X E, the former for a company formerly called Blackwater, in which that executive describes a nearly global enterprise shot through with criminality, arms dealing, fraud, tax evasion, child prostitution, murder, all of which Z denies, even in cases where its employees have already pleaded guilty. One motive for all this, the four-year executive claims, was greed. Tonight, in our third story, the other motive was God. Jeremy Scahill, who first broke this story for The Nation magazine, wrote the definitive book on Blackwater in which he details some of the theocratic connections of founder Eric Prince. Now that former Blackwater executive, known only as John Doe No. 2, claims that Prince did more than subscribe to a fundamentalist Christian ideology. He used Z to advance it. Quote, Mr. Prince is motivated to engage in misconduct by two factors. First, he views himself as a Christian crusader tasked with eliminating Muslims and the Islamic faith from the globe. To that end, Mr. Prince intentionally deployed to Iraq certain men who shared his vision of Christian supremacy, knowing and wanting these men to take every available opportunity to murder Iraqis. Many of these men used call signs based on the Knights of the Templar, the warriors who fought the Crusades. As a young man, Eric Prince was an intern for the first President Bush and for the Family Research Council, the right-wing religious organization his father helped to start. He later complained about his White House internship. Quote, I saw a lot of things I did not agree with. Homosexual groups being invited in, the Budget Agreement, the Clean Air Act. A Catholic convert, Prince has donated more than a quarter of a million dollars to conservative Republican politicians, primarily the religious ones. He has used the wealth of his family and profits from Z to create and to fund numerous right-wing and or proselytizing Christian organizations, the Family Research Council, Christian Freedom International, and the Council on National Policy, whose meetings Prince said he has attended. That last group... The CNP was founded by this man, the Reverend Tim LaHaye, whose Left Behind series dramatizes his biblical beliefs that in the near future, Solomon's temple in Israel will be rebuilt. Jesus then returns, making true believers vanish away with him. Those left behind who accept Jesus battle the unbelievers. Such serious shit. So, I, I mean, look, in a nutshell, what we're seeing right now, right, is... is this, this religious dominionism, that's what it is. Tim LaHaye was basically a dominionist propagandist. And, and this, dominionism this, this, is basically the idea that um, God, there should be a theocracy run by you know, your God and government, all forms of life should center around God. Um, and the, the reason is that that according to this demented version of the Bible that they believe in, 
um, those are the conditions for the end times. Yeah. And the end times is, of course, the apocalypse where Jesus comes down on his magic carpet, picks up all the good Christians, and everybody else is left behind yeah. to suffer in, you know, whatever molten lava pits or whatever we're supposed to live in uh, after they get taken it's also out. It's also worthy to note that the C&P was also the, the organizers that put together the America's Frontline Doctors Group. Yeah. Went, look, we, that went, that went on. Yeah, we can't go down that road. I know. I'm just. I'm in the, the CNP. Yeah. Yeah. So let's not I'm do just, that. Yeah. We but are. Yes, the CNP is a incredibly important very power, and very dark, very powerful you know, terrorist yeah, organization. That's right. That's right. Hi, hey, uh, two two things I want to say about the CNP. If you want to know about the CNP, you got to watch Charles Creel's People You May Know, mm -hmm. which is out there on streaming services. And you got to read Ann Nelson's book, The Shadow Network. Yes, that's right. Fantastic. Two Follow absolute her, sources sure. you got to get. We'll make also, sure to link, link to those. By yeah. the way, our guest last week is extremely knowledgeable on the CNP and has written yeah, Dave you know, Troy a too. lot of yeah. um, very good work on that. We'll this make sure gives to me link to those. Yeah. This gives me an opportunity. Yes, and we will always, the stuff we discuss, I will always link in our radicalized uh, pod Twitter threads. Um, this gives me an opportunity to talk about our upcoming guest once we get through your news block, Jim, Shar Norris, who uh, works on a lot of extremism reporting for Byline Times. And I have done multiple CNP uh, related stories for Byline, including an interview with Ann Nelson about how they're financing all the voter fuckery, uh, as well as uh, the interview I did with Dave Troy. The things you're describing with Prince are also the things that are being embraced uh, through the connections with extreme right in the Kremlin. So it's bone chilling stuff. Uh, let's keep going because we have some uh, real real life examples of it, including what happened in Rotterdam, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. You want to run that, Sean? One second. Let me cue that up here. Sure. Okay. So this go. happened this, this weekend in Rotterdam. You don't have to play the whole thing. Welcome in now from Rotterdam. Kijk, die bus is te lukken. Hey, kijk dan, joh. Kijk de Slena, nee. Yeah, so there's there's a whole bunch of these um uh the, the this artillery basically going on around everyone. And then you know, it's probably 60 seconds in, you hear a very different sound. It's a crack, 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 and clearly actual gunfire. Um, so I, I don't know what the death toll and injury toll was, but um, Rotterdam was a war zone. And the reason it was a war zone, COVID disinformation. Oh, wow. Those were COVID protests. Quote, wow. Wow. Uh, were they anti vax or were they anti lockdown? Yes. Yeah. Oh, they were anti vaxxers. Yes. It's, it's anti disinformation. Passport. Yeah. So one of the one of the you know scariest things is that I'm seeing is that the this anti vaccine stuff is getting really, really heavily um, indoctrinated into the neo Nazi communities. And uh, the neo-Nazis, I believe, are the ones who were in Rotterdam turning it into a war zone. Um, so uh, I, what, I would uh, like to point out just real fast that if you look at a lot of the anti-vaccine uh, protests that are happening around the United States right now, uh, a lot of them have members of the Proud Boys marching along with them. Absolutely. Uh, Nick yeah, Fuentes, Nick Fuentes yeah. did an entire like speech in front of the Capitol, I think it was Michigan, um, that was 45 minutes that l basically sounded like if Hitler was anti-vax. Yeah. I mean, Nick Fuentes is a, is a Holocaust denying, you know, killed the Jews Nazi, like he like is a real Nazi. And now he's got this America first movement. It used to be the Groypers and he's, fully embrace this anti-vaccine stuff as the way to 
sort of um, uh, and turn action into the idea of great great replacement theory right mm -hmm. great replacement theory is the sort of core fiction of neo-nazis that there's a big right. plan to get rid of all the white people yeah and so and they're using this COVID shit as a as, as a kind of pretend um you know vector for the for the whoever it is that's supposed to be killing all the white people super quick jim uh in rotterdam multiple injuries and what police called an orgy of violence and yet you said that they were celebrating on telegram oh it was it was it was fourth of july man they loved it mm. um not not just the neo-nazi forums but all the QAnon forums um you know the the serious extremists like you know there's a lot of very dark um, sort of neo-Nazi Orthodox Christian um, channels. All of them were basically looking at this and saying it begins, right? They, or, 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 you know, keep going or, you know, it was just a, 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 a orgy of excitement about the idea that our world might be falling into complete chaos. Yeah. That's the thing they're, they're... that people need to get is like the worse it gets, the worse they will get which is why we need action and which is why we need people who are orchestrating ahead, the violence five. at the I, highest I interview, level. Interrupted high five. Like oh, times. yes. I'm, I'm, I'm saying a, lo a lot of these people who are raw rawing this stuff online all come from, I mean, it's expanded massively, but the core group started with uh, the incel movements on the chans, uh, you know, 4chan, 8chan, um, just they got together, they amplified each other. Yeah. Somebody had a plan to take over the planet and they're like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's plunge the world into chaos. Let's do it for the lulls. Yeah, that's wow. where this it's, started. It, it, it's not the lulls. That, that's, that's, well, what they, that's what they, that was the satirical front that they put on. Yeah, it, right. right. Um, yeah, no, they, anyway, they want chaos, they want death. About, about uh, Gamergate and oh, I can't the wait. origins of all this shit uh, let's, I uh, with our guests. So let's, I would love you to get through these really, um, the, I don't want to cut the stuff that you have here. I don't want to cut because it's too yeah. important. What Hillary said, um, which we'll get to, that buttress what Dave Troy was saying. And then also you connected some serious dots on the 2016 Hillary setup by Mike Flynn and cohorts. Can you just give us a quick explainer on that? Yeah. Um, so it turns out, uh, I don't know, everyone who, you know, was alive will remember that right before the election in 2016, the FBI, Comey, reopened Hillary's case a couple of weeks before because there was some new stuff about the emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop. There were like hidden files or something like that. And they had to make sure that they were really, you know, uh, they were, there weren't more classified emails on there. And it was pure bullshit and it was debunked within 12 hours, but it did not matter. It, it took her down several points and absolutely I don't shouldn't say absolutely, arguably, well, arguably flipped the the results through the, of the election, election to Trump. Yeah, so through now, the election to Trump. Why did that? How did that happen, and why? Well, there was a guy named Brian McCauley who is an who was an ex FBI agent in 2016, and Mike Flynn met with him. Dana Warbacker, who's the guy uh, that. Kevin McCarthy said Putin pays, right? Yeah. Because goddamn right he does. Who Eric Prince interned for back in the day. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, it was this guy, Macaulay um, Flynn. And uh, Macaulay uh, got paid $28,000 on, I think it was September 20th um, of 2016. Shit. A couple weeks later, He's the guy who backs up the story that forces the F, that or forces Comey to open the case against Hillary. Yeah, right. Mike well, it, paid for that off. Yeah, like, like there's records. He paid so, for the op that flipped the election to Hillary 
Clinton. And leading up to that, remember, he was also involved in, in WikiLeaks, Pizzagate, Puma, Seth Rich, all of that. All of those were psyops specifically aimed at Hillary. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Mike Flynn, I don't even know if it's arguable, by himself effectively stole the 2016 elections. And at that exact moment, he was being paid large amounts of money by Turkey, <clears throat> by Russia, by, you know, Egypt, UAE, was the UAE like in there? Um, yeah. So it's just now, now with all of the context that we've seen and now with what he's doing right now, you can just look back and say, look, he stole, he, it's right there in public what he did then. Why are we arresting him for that, much less what he's doing now? That's right. Yeah. Right. right. That's exactly right. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's important that people understand also that the depth of the, the injury that has been done to this country is not just what they're doing now, right? It's the entire Trump presidency. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I am here to say that, that, that he was illegitimate. Yeah. And Jimmy and, Carter and agrees. I think with it you. needs. I think history needs to reflect it. Because yeah. I think we all need to heal. We all need to understand that. No, we're not. We weren't fucking nuts when that happened. We were like, wait, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, it happened because people were waging war on us at the time. That's right. That's right. Cognitive warfare. Uh, Putin did not want Hillary Clinton as president because she got his number. Robert Mercer did not want Hillary Clinton as president because she got her number. And what was Hillary Clinton doing 20 years before 2016? She was trying to solve America's health care crisis, which she was excoriated for by right wing media. So we lost yeah. a lot. We actually could have had a mother in the White House at a time of climate change who might have actually given a shit and tried to fix a few things. Instead, we got a monster. And what you just said, Jim, is bringing back a lot of uh, personal um, pain. Yeah, no, me too. But I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's it's just important to understand the scale of what these people have done. Yes. Yeah, and, and so yes, we, we bring... should not have despair to high, high five point. We need to fight these motherfuckers and get our country back. We are We're... beaten. We are scarred. We are traumatized, but fuck you, we are still fighting. I'm right. One thing I want to tell our viewers is that I get the privilege of being in rundown meetings with these guys, and it's like listening to war veterans. Uh, these are war veterans. We all who have been fighting this have our battle scars, and these guys in the trenches, I hope, in some kind of future, it's really acknowledged for all the work that you put in. Before we bring in Sharn, one more last thing. We have a Gorgon of the Week, and I'd like to know what the Gorgon of the Week is. Um, is this, this is- Crypto, yes. Speaking yeah, of right. Clinton, who, and, and listen to me, my leftist brothers and sisters, those feelings that you had in 2016 about how she was evil and gross and something was wrong with her and god we could never you know like trump even trump would be better right all those feelings that you had it was a fucking psyop okay it really was you were being manipulated you were influenced by bad people Yep, yep. Um, and so and so Hillary was right about everything she said. I'm not. I wasn't the biggest Hillary fan. I'm not like some like Hillary bot. I don't. Give, I didn't. Wasn't a particular fan of hers. But yep. she was fucking right. She was right that Trump was a puppet of the Russians. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and and right about what they were doing to her. And she's right about this. And so now I would like Sean to play this. Do you have that video, Sean? because what looks like a somewhat exotic uh, effort to uh, literally mine uh, new coins in order to trade with them has the potential for undermining uh, currencies, for undermining the uh, 
uh, role of the dollar as the reserve currency for destabilizing nations, perhaps starting with small ones, but going much larger. So when we think about this new environment in which we find ourselves that we've been discussing for the last uh, some minutes, um, we can't just think about nation states. So we might fix it in post, we, we might not. I see her and I immediately get so emotional because of what we lost, but we had Dave Troy on talking about the dangers of crypto. So you picked that as your fourth news story because because Hillary was right. Dave yeah. is right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, crypto, listen, it, it was invented by billionaire libertarians to destroy the dollar so that they could control the economy. Really? Like it's yeah. it's nonsense. It do, oh. like it doesn't exist. Yes, is there is there a place for a future where there is a blockchain based economy? Maybe. As a as a society, we should we should figure that out and decide to do it. Not have a bunch of weirdos with way too much money yeah. uh, and bad intents out there building these financial instruments of mass destruction. It's nonsense. If you're buying Bitcoin at sixty thousand dollars, you are out of your goddamn mind. Stop it. It's a pump and dump scheme. Yeah. It's, well, uh, I called it a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Same, same, same. Basic same deal. Diff. Well, same basic diff. just a little. Anyway, um, Hillary was right, and yeah. uh, don't buy Bitcoin. Uh, like, and don't don't fall for that shit. Really, it's it's silly. It, yes. It's Peter Thiel and a bunch of his anarcho capitalist like um, friends trying to trying to destroy the world. Mm. And no, just seriously. Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> and just a quick and for anybody who missed the first episode, watch the first episode for an in-depth explainer on why this magic internet right. money is out to try to destroy democracies. Uh, but also I had investigated Trump over the years in the in the 2000s, and he was always affiliated with Ponzi schemers and pyramid schemers. That's his milieu. This is an extension of that type of transnational corruption. And on that happy note, let's welcome our guest. Let's bring yeah. in Char Norris. Just she is my partner in crime. Yay. The dog yeah. invest. She's my partner in crime and deep dive investigations into the extreme right wing fuckery at Byline Times. She's been lurking in the worst places to bring us the news on radicalization. She's a feminist activist for women's rights, LGBTQ rights. She began covering extremism because she saw people being drawn in by this misogyny. And she's a wonderful, brilliant person. So have at it, everybody. Welcome. I'm really Hi. glad you're here. It's nice to be here. Thanks for coming on, Char. Thanks so yes. much. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Char, you look wonderful. Don't bother adjusting for us. Okay. <laughs> you're great. You're great. Uh, look, so I, I've said I've said myself many times. It misog it's it always goes back to the misogyny. Yeah. It really does. At its core, there is a fundamental, you know, bad place in men and that gets exploited yeah it, yeah it, because it they're does. insecure about their masculinity so yeah. they it's a they whole take it out on yeah. women for some reason it's yeah. sad yep or there's yeah. been abuse in their past and trauma that they can't overcome and so the result is finding an outlet they're, for it which is you know typically been you know uh, uh negative and very harmful obviously I, I love these like beautiful not mea culpas but these beautiful profound moments between the team here because they're basically saying we understand it we don't like it either um, right. before jim gets started because i know he really wants to discuss gamergate with you um sharn and i uh, and some of the crew here have been working on a, a written house piece that we hope sees sunlight because you're going to start seeing some really bad fucking people behind him and we're looking forward to exposing that um all right jim what questions do you have for Sharn? Oh, I, I, I don't have any particular questions, but given your, your, your background, obviously you've, you know, looked a lot into Gamergate and sort of the, 
the uh, you know the foundations of the alt right come from there, right? The 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 incel movement was um, you know didn't start in 2013, 2014, but it sure got you know um, going because of Gamergate in a major way. I was just curious on your, you know, kind of re reflections on that period and how it how it relates to what we see right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for anyone who's watching who doesn't know, Gamergate was this kind of explosion of online misogyny um, that was triggered by a couple of things. There was there was this accusation that a game developer um, had been in a relationship with a games journalist and and that there'd been some kind of you know bad behavior that meant she was getting better reviews than she really deserved and things like that and another issue of a young woman who was making a series about gendered tropes in games and these two issues kind of converged to create this this complete explosion this real anger in the the, the white male gaming community and i think what's what i find really interesting now is when you look back at gamergate we should have been paying more attention. Like all of the signs were there. Everything that has happened since began in those moments. You know, we saw what it was like to have kind of these organized pylons of men attacking women in very, very violent, very, very threatening ways. Milo, he, Game Gate was his, his birth. You know, he went from being this kind of weird tech journalist in London that we all sort of was like, what's he doing over there to becoming this this megastar of the alt-right and and he really used the Gamergate as a platform to start kind of attacking the left to start attacking feminism to create these ideas about snowflakes who can't cope with a little bit of rough yeah. and tumble and debate we also saw the fact that you couldn't report what was going on in Gamergate and this is so often the case with really extreme misogyny really extreme racism online because it's so violent because the language is so grotesque you can't report it and then this creates a sort of false Sure. Um, idea of what's actually going on because you look on the news it's like oh they said that she was a bit stupid or they said she was a right. witch it's like well actually there's very very real very very violent very very graphic threats happening and then perhaps overarching all of that was this crossover between white supremacy and misogyny that we saw in Gamergate so one of the things that really came out of Gamergate was the attacks on um, the actress is it Leslie Jones who was the black women in Ghostbusters you know this you know the kind of Ghostbusters thing was again it's like women are ruining everything they're, they're, they're ruining the things I love my fan culture my games my the movies that I watched as a kid um, and she was a particular target of the gamergating community the kind of outright misogynistic community online so we sort of saw this this idea of misogyny becoming a gateway drug to white supremacy and then targeting women high profile women like her and then when you go beyond Gamergate into the kind of red pill movements, the incel movements, that idea of misogyny being a gateway to white supremacy is really, really obvious. You know, you spend time on an incel um, forum, it's very, very white. There's, there's a huge amount of extremely racist, yeah. extremely upsetting language. Even if you were a, a black or minority ethnic person who was interested in insult, I don't think you'd, you'd be in those spaces for very long because the, the I just wanted to point out one thing you said that's important which is that um, the red pill, right? Mm. Which people think of now as, as just sort of a generic, um, you know, graduation into white supremacy mm. was originally about misogyny specifically. It was originally yeah. about, being, uh, about being angry at women and yeah. morphed over time, literally the uh. trend did into being what we see now which is a far more generic sort of yeah i didn't realize awakened into the mega cult i didn't realize that jim but that's yeah, interesting absolutely. i came into it later yeah i have i have the origins of the red pill what you see is it, it began as this kind of, as a community for for men and predominantly white men who who yeah. had that resentment about not being able to get women and so the, the original kind of emphasis in red pill communities was to turn you from a beta male or a beta male into an alpha male and you did this by physical self-improvement so like getting really hench doing loads of gym exercise and by gaming women so getting as many women as you could to sleep with you and there was a you know a lot of the stuff on the forums was really about kind of sharing this kind of 
culture of, of fitness and gaming women and talking about women in really, really derogatory ways, really seeing women not as human beings, not as someone that you might want to chat to or have a relationship with or just have a friendship with, but seeing women as objects that you have to own and then you can discard them. And it, it's dehumanizing, right? Mm, it's it's mm. what all cults do. And, and I, th I think, you know, for me, one thing that you know, realized that I realized just kind of in retrospect is that Gamergate was a cult. Yeah. It really was. There's no, you know, way way around it, at least the the, the core of it. Um, all of and, the and cult-like behavior were there, all of the HN stuff that was going on, Reddit stuff. Um, you know, it, it was a, a, a model for what we see now, right? Yeah the model Absolutely. for all the all the ones that came later they saw that they could literally create these insular worlds online yeah. and put whatever they wanted into their head and in this case it was it was misogyny i have okay. uh, three yeah. questions before hi-fi goes three quick things one one comment two questions because we're bootlegging our wi-fi from a hotel right now uh, if you try to move less, you'll freeze less. So I'm just throwing it out there to everybody. Uh, I have two questions for you, uh, and then I want Hi-Fi to jump in. Um, is what you are probing organic, or is everything by design working toward some kind of goal by the same people that we are seeing fuck everybody up in all of the arenas that Jim and Hi-Fi are lurking in and two how do you protect your psyche going into those spaces i had to do it for a living for 20 years i have post-traumatic news syndrome i can't do it anymore so in terms of the first question there's a really interesting example of how this happens with the red pill community and the trump election so as i was saying um in the run before sort of 2016 Red Pill is very much focused on self-improvement in, in a really disturbing, horrible, misogynistic way. Like, how do I how do I become this this alpha male that can 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 get game and get women? And then in the run up to the Trump election throughout 2016, you started to see more and more posters coming in and politicizing the forum to be pro-Trump. Mm -hmm. And there's some really interesting research oh, on this um, okay. from the University of Florida. So they started to promote Trump as very much the alpha, the alpha of the alpha males, that he was going to win the war on men. And if Hillary won, that would mean the war on men was, was lost, that men had lost. And so I think what we really saw was, was this very political, very organized effort to, 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 to get these very angry white men to go out and vote for Trump because he was seen as this promise of everything that they'd been trying to get the big alpha male who could just go and sexually harass women with impunity. So I think that was a really clear example of where, you know, this isn't organic. This, I mean, there are obviously cases where it is, but there is a clear kind of pattern of political actors moving in to politicize these spaces so that they become less sort of about the self and individualistic and more into a right. movement. Thank you. In terms of like self-protection, I always check just like, you know, just have a drink at the end of the day. Yeah. But I think one of the things that I found really useful when I was spending a lot of time on incel forums was I would handwrite everything because it was almost like I was just copying what they were saying. And I would give yeah. kind of a distance. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, my, my best friend, who's very like um, into kind of spiritual practice and things, she talks about putting on the silver shield. And yeah. so yeah. it's a nice yeah. thing to think of just like, okay, yeah. I'm I'm Sorry. protected and then it is washed away at the end. You got to put your armor on, yeah. Before the boys jump in, um, we do have our first episode had a significant uh, viewership of 65 and older, maybe like a quarter of, so that's really incredible. I'm going to guess they're not going to know what an incel is. So can you describe what that is? Yeah, sure. So the incels, the incel community is short for involuntary celibate and it's an extremist men's rights sort of grouping online who believe that well who, who believe that they can't get a sexual partner a female sexual partner and believe that they are owed one so that they're entitled to women's bodies and entitled to own women's bodies so again they're not seeing women as human they're not seeing as women as worthy of of friendship connection relationship they're really seeing women as bodies that they should have 
and, and should have them sexually. And there's, I mean, there's loads of other stuff that goes on in those forums. That Thank you for that. That's super helpful. And gentlemen, I'd like you to answer those two questions too. One about the co-opting of something that may have started somewhat organically. And two, how you guys protect yourselves um, because this is not for the weak of heart. I mean, look, I, Sorry, I, for, for me, I think the uh, there's nothing organic about the overall movement, but they take advantage of organic properties of, of um, you know, uh, society and, and human behavior, right? So they, there is a lot of sort of emergent behavior that happens in these places, but, you know, as um, Sean was saying, it, 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 it's directed by these political actors that push it in specific ways by introducing things like Trump, by introducing these, you know, these Nazi ideology to, you know, what did sort of start out as a, as just a little scandal about a, a you know, a game um, was totally taken over. There was, once that began, there was nothing organic about it, right? There, there was no reason for that thing to turn into what it did, right? It only did that because it either profited people or pushed their political purposes forward. It wasn't profiting anybody. <laughs> there was no, nobody was making money from Gamergate outside of a few streamers. Um, it, it, was, it was about the politics and Steve Bannon is the one who told Milo to do the thing uh, and start covering Gamergate in Breitbart. Steve Bannon, uh, you know, has said many times out loud that he saw it as an opportunity uh, to radicalize young white men into, yeah. you know, the Republican Party, but he really means fascism. That's right. Okay. Um, Thank you. And then uh, the protecting part, uh, I, I have no idea at this point, Heidi. Wow. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> right now it's just sort of blunt forced trauma I <laughs> just so I've, I've done it for so many I've literally thousands of hours I've you yeah. know been in there and um it's just you just after a while you get used to it and you you create a a, a buffer zone mm -hmm. but it took a long time and it and and you know kind of fucked me up so right? I, I, <laughs> like, yeah. like look at me i'm like all radicalized and stuff yeah. <laughs> yeah. hey maybe we should do a show called radicalize yeah. wait what so, uh, so I, actually, uh, Sean. I actually uh have to i've had to deal with this again like you guys know i came into this through the the legal realm and so part of our struggle is when we're reading discovery for years, right? There's nothing happening in the mass tort litigation. Nothing's moving forward. Depositions are being taken, but you're reading these horrifying strategies by these corporations on how to, you know, profit by people's dying. Yeah. Very, very, very difficult, uh, um, psychological, uh, uh, arenas, not too dissimilar from what you guys are in. So I actually have a practice that I formulated, I can share with you guys. It's just called a, a sunrise gratitude. So if you're in that place of depression, where you're passive, you're not making any more movements. If you wake up and you with the with the sun, so you have to get up at sunrise, you face the sun as it rises and just give one sort of gratitude, just give a thank of whatever it is. If you do that every day for seven days, has to be seven days, that you, for whatever reason, you will feel this sense of uh, oh, wellness or wholeness. So if you get up with the sun every day for seven days and just give a, a, a thank, whatever you, religion background you may have, Right. For, seven, for seven days, you'll feel feel much better. I, I want to say something to that. I don't touch my phone or open my eyes or do anything without saying all the things I'm thankful for the moment I wake up. Because if I touch my phone before I say all the things I'm thankful for, down the rabbit hole of despair, I might go. Yeah. Hi-Fi, on the other hand, starts with a cigarette and a Red Bull. <laughs> hey, Hi-Fi, chime in. Um, so... I would say my history with these people and the things they're doing right now goes back approximately 20 some years, maybe a little bit more. Um, I used to hang out on the something awful forum. If 
I, I really think oh, that gee. was a root. Yeah, that was a root of all where everything went horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, something awful kids. And then they ended up on 4chan. Um, I was there, uh, got in and trolled with the best of them and realized quickly it's, it's a game of, of who can, who can be more traumatizing to each other, who can be meaner, who can be more alpha. Um, so something awful to 4chan be, uh, be, you know, that's where a lot of the bros, um, came from and, then there was a kind of a split where when all the Nazis and uh, people into pedophilia and whatnot showed up and some of those people went over to 420 Chan, uh, which is run, you know, was set up and run by Aubrey Cottle. He created the forum. I, which is insurrection. That is where anonymous came from. The strategies that Anonymous used in both in real life organization and online organization um, were co-opted by Gamergate uh, and the trolling that came from the bros, uh, except now they weren't doing it to each other. They were externalizing it and doing it to people outside. Um, that was, yeah, it was in turn weaponized by Steve Bannon, uh, you know, paid for by all sorts of tech billionaires, um, enabled by all sorts of tech billionaires. Uh, if you look at data from the recent Epic hack, right? Um, yeah, that's the history of kind of how we got here. Thank you for that. Hi-Fi. I wanted to, um, there are so many questions that I have for Sharn and I'm wondering if we have a part two with her because I think that we could actually really um, have a profoundly, you know, amazing hour long conversation. But I yeah. have two, two things that I'd like to bring up. Um, you and I work a lot on the intersection of UK and US right wing extremism. Is there anything you can speak to in kind of like broad strokes about what you see, like just sort of a quick way for people to wrap their head around it? I think you're not muted uh, right now, Sean. Yeah. So. In terms of the UK and the US, it, it is quite complicated. I think the, the sort of far right movement in the UK has been quite, is quite different in some ways to the US, in part because we don't have the same religious fundamentalism that happens in the US. So although there are kind of small fringe uh, Christian fundamentalist groups who are very like anti-abortion, anti-LGBT, um, they, they are definitely on the fringes in, as opposed to in the States where you have something like Alliance Defending Freedom or the Family Research Council or Focus on the Family, which have got so much weight and so much wealth behind them. But what I do find really interesting is because of the internet and because of these, because of the way that the forums are working and sort of extremism is, is evolving, we, we'd have these transnational cooperation and transnational networks. You almost don't need to have the kind of movements that you did in the past because people mm -hmm. are organizing online. And so I think what's really concerning is whether you're a fascist or a neo-Nazi in the UK or the US, you fundamentally believe the same things. You believe that there is a great replacement. You believe that there is a white genocide and you, you are planning towards this kind of boogaloo ethno, ethno civil wars that will create these sort of pure race, racial states. So whereas I think in the past, if you look in sort of like the 70s or the 80s, we would have had like the skinhead movement in the UK and a very different kind of far right looking movement in the US. Now there might not be kind of groups writing to each other or, or planning the same marches, but they have a shared belief system and a shared ideology that is crossing borders in a much faster and much more fluid way. And that's really concerning. I think- uh, Thank you for that. I think it would be great to have another part B to this where we could get some content and put on the screen without this Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, well, but but I think what she just said was amazing. And it made me course. think about how much investigating I've done on all of the money that's been laundered through London and through New York. And, oh, you know, some of these fake rich guys that we're tormented by are simply money launderers and bag men for a lot of oligarchs and I know we all know about that, but one thing I do want to ask that I'd like all of you to respond to is how is a Rittenhouse engineered? And if you guys can just tell me off the top of your head with all of your experience in the trenches of this shit, these kids are engineered. 
I mean, I don't know if he's, I mean, I don't know if, if somebody like wound him up and turned him into a Manchurian Nazi or whatever, but, uh, you know, we were talking about stochastic terrorism before, right? And this was a BLM protest. And the fascist right has been attacking BLM and turn and Antifa, which doesn't even exist, into these bo boogeymen, right? And so Rittenhouse was going there with his AR-15, hoping to hoping to get into it with Antifa. I don't I don't even know if it had much to do with, although he he did give the white supremacist, uh, you know, hand signal. Um, but I think his parents were just basically racists who let his let their son play with guns however he wanted his mom drove him to the damn place with his gun mm -hmm. um i think it's just horrendous parenting and you know basically a a uh you know the kind of thing that was ultimately destined to happen as hi-fi was saying before is just mathematically going to happen if you get enough pissed off white supremacist young people with ars people are going to die yeah. and, yeah. and that's i need to bring up another word here and it's it's uh, it's another phrase that i think people need to know it's called cognitive hacking right yeah and and if you Hackers look for vulnerabilities in systems. They look for cracks in the systems where they can, you know, drive in a wedge and get in farther into a system. Cognitive hacking is doing the same thing, but doing it to humans, right? And if you look at Kyle Rittenhouse, he is from a broken home. Uh, there are, you know, allegations that his uh, father engaged in domestic violence. Uh, there is video that exists of Kyle himself hitting a girl from behind yeah. uh, when she was fighting with uh, his sister, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these are classic vulnerabilities to be exploited, and they are. And, you know, the, the kid wanted to be a cop. Well, we know that police have, you know, a 40% higher incidence of domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, because of the authoritarian model that they adhere to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the same thing. They're doing it online, I guess. Um, so what I'd like is for Sharn to give us her thoughts on that. Um, but I, I, I appreciate you guys taking a thoughtful moment because I think we are always swinging at the wrong target. We want to hate the kid. The kid's a symptom of something far more sinister. And if we can figure out how these kids are engineered, maybe we can figure out how we reverse engineer it and start to fix this problem, Sharn? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's so complicated, like who knows what, what drives people to do these, these things. But I think when you look at the glorification of violence on kind of the sort of extremist misogynistic sites where mass shooters are, are celebrated as like supreme gentlemen, where there's this real sense that you are engaged in a war. And when we look at the red pill stuff that was engaged on this war on men, but now the way that has evolved in this kind of fascist thought architecture is that we're in a global ethnic war and we, you know, we're in a race war. And so when you're kind of immersed in all of this rhetoric and this huge amount of focus on glorifying militaristic violence and and thinking about far right violence in terms of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people on the far right use militaristic terms. They they want to form militias. They they refer to each other as kind of commandos or captains or officers in these armies. And I think all of this combines to kind of to to create a force of 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 what has happened, like this lethal violence. It's it's a it's a process of grooming and it's a process of of radicalization. And of course the thing is we know what to call it when it's not white young men, you know, when it's brown young men, they people are much more comfortable talking about grooming and radicalization. But actually what is happening to young white men in these spaces is 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 extremist radicalization. Thank you. That's right. I mean, that's essentially why we launched this show. Jim, did you want to say something? It's really not yeah. very different from ISIS. Yeah, um, right. I, it's, in, in fact, there's, you know, some of the, some of the, one of the, one of the worst offshoots of, of Gamergate was MAGA3X, and they basically used literal ISIS planning. They had cells that had limited information and a specific target 
and they would basically get wound up and sent off uh, you know, to, to accomplish the mission, um, without, you know, knowing who was telling them to do it. There's all the same sort of layers of, of, of secrecy and insulation that leads to this kind of serious radicalization. They did it in DM chats, they did it in Facebook groups, they did it in discord, they did it in all these places. Once they got them into these little, these kind of smaller groups, it's, it's, and you know it's frankly it's not a coincidence mike flynn was in afghanistan and knows all about how that stuff works right uh, a lot of the people a lot of these guys my, eric prince too as we were talking about before knows all about islamic radicalization he screams about it at the top of his lungs and then goes and does it to american white men i just want to say it was you know a year ago 2020 when we had this, this explosion after the George Floyd murder of demanding justice, social justice, and demanding you know that we right historic wrongs. So here we are deep into 2021 and we are seeing this grotesque uh, fight back uh, from some you know, all the same people that we have been investigating for the last five years. And so when we talk about an influence war, I think this is what we're essentially talking about. Uh, who votes to have Sharn come back on as soon as possible? Me. <laughs> yeah, she, it's, it's, it's past midnight. Thank you her so much. Time. Yeah, she, yeah we should. She, very late. <laughs> she, she stayed up until 1230 UK. Time. Thank you. Great. So we're, grateful. we're very grateful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. It's really nice to talk. And hopefully we'll be dropping our bomb tomorrow, Sharn, and we'll keep on pointing people in the right direction. Thanks again to this brilliant team that we have assembled here. Um, can't wait to have you back. Can't wait to discuss some of the books you're working on. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, get some sleep. Thanks, Sharn. Yeah, bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sharn. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Oh, my God. She's awesome. Fantastic. She, she's yeah, so, Sharn's she's great. I, I knew that you guys would appreciate her because you know she's not only so brainy, um, but it's she plays against type. She's this incredible young woman who can really bring the point of view of what it's like to be a woman going into the spaces that you guys go into. And a few people do it, but she's I think clear, I think, clear warrior, man. She's, yeah, she's, yeah, she is. Too, <laughs> she is. She, yeah. She's of my of my kind. I like it. Do you know to, that? To steal like, some Nordage hair. And look at that shit for, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to uh, say that the me. reason Sharn and I started working together, and now we, we do uh, joint bylines every opportunity we get about all this serious shit we're talking about, is because when I sent off the QAnon interview that I did with you at the end of July or uh, beginning of August, she grabbed it because that was in her that was in her her bailiwick and she's like oh i got this and she edited it and we've been working on stories ever since and so she's awesome she's quite the warrior goddess and i appreciate you guys uh and your thoughtful um interview with her and now i think for a palate cleanser it's time for sean's digital descent if we can actually pull it off with our bootleg wi-fi <laughs> we're so classy. I'll, uh, I'll be very happy if we can get this last video run yeah, we'll see. Let's do it. Let's do right. it. I, I'll be happy too. We got this. <laughs> Here we go. Don't have despair. This is the yeah. <laughs> this is a few weeks old now, but this is Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, as I envision her in uh, her daily day to day life. You get to see what's in Sean's to brain. Their fake committee that isn't even constitutional because they aren't even allowing uh, the opposite side, our our Republican conference, to participate. So I yelled at them on the House floor. I let I let Liz Cheney have it. I let Adam Schiff have it, and I let Raskin have it. I just. I couldn't contain myself and I said, you people are a joke. You don't care about the American people. You don't care about what the American, and, and they just like laughed it <laughs> off as if I had nothing important to say. But that is the truth, Steve. They're selfish, they're, they're self-righteous, and they're completely obsessed and wrapped up in a world that is so fake and that's Washington, D.C. and I'm so disgusted with it. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Oh. <laughs> oh.
Oh, hell to the yes, Sean. Yeah. If, she, if she's so disgusted, why doesn't she go home? I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, because she doesn't do anything. <laughs> she, um, she was paid to do nothing. Yeah. Uh, she I, pays fines. Oh, no, no. We'll no, see no, if no. she pays. Oh, she hasn't paid her fines she's yet? She's got lots to do. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's oh, trying yeah. to not, not for, well, not for know, her constituents or the country. No. So I've been given a news alert that somebody's teeth are swimming. So we're going to do the wrap up really fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, my thoughts are that you guys are amazing. I love you. And that Char Norris can't come back soon enough. I look forward to it. Yeah, she was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Do you guys Anybody else? Anybody else have a quick little wrap up? Uh, Sharn's a freaking shield maiden. You know, she is right yes. there next to us on the, in the, the front lines of this psychotic online world we're living in. That's right. Jim? Uh, I don't know. Just, just pay pay attention um, and and speak out. I can't yeah. emphasize enough. The speak one thing out. I wanted to say: this is a race. It's a race that we're in between getting the world to understand in the first place what's happening and their ability to prevent us from doing that, literally. That's part of the reason why I think all of us are so driven, why I feel yeah. this sense of urgency is because they are trying to take this down and we need to get people to understand that fast enough to do something about it. Right on. And so, so please. Right. Uh, and Sean has a serious sense of urgency. So we're going to roll the credits. But that guy's I gonna out. love you guys. Stay rad. Come back next Aww. week. Thank you so much for supporting us. See you soon. Are you, okay? Are you all right, Sean? Yeah. <laughs> Did you go? I gotta stop the recording. <laughs>